The Core 360 belt is the best aid to train the abdominal wall. The Core 360 is a patent pending, first of its kind training belt that helps you move, breathe, and perform better. We use the Core 360 belt with almost every patient at Winchester Spine and Sport. The biofeedback is second to none, and it's an amazing way to teach proper respiration and can be even used during higher level movements in the gym. Teaching proper respiration is about as fun as a rash, but with the Core 360 belt, you take all the headaches away. Visit core360belt.com and use the code GESTALT for 10% all off all belts, ohm track sensors not included. Again, visit core360, C-O-R-E 360, B-E-L-T.com and use the code GESTALT for 10% off. Enjoy the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, Brett, we are in Colorado Springs, so we are with uh, the one, the only. We got Mike the legend Lady, here, yes. The, the, uh, the OG Active Release Technique Headquarters. Uh, man, what a sweet facility. I mean, we've we've been lucky, Brett. I mean, we've sat down with the best of the best and seen some amazing facilities, and this is top one or two. So I think this takes a case. Yeah, yeah, this is pretty yeah. special. So, uh, Dr. Leahy, thank you for allowing us to be here today and for sitting down with us. I'll invite to. This should uh, be fun. Yeah, we're, we're really excited. This has been on our bucket list for a long time. So, uh, I guess to start, I, I want to talk about two things with you. One, your background is Crazier than I thought it was, put it that way. So one of the more unique backgrounds as far as how you got here. And then two, ART was literally the, the gateway drug, if you want to call it, to sports chiropractic, to uh, to really launching chiropractic into mainstream sports. And so we thank you for that, number one. But then we want to talk about that evolution. So will you just give us like a 30-second, uh, I don't know, or a minute or your background? Uh, um, you're an engineer, you're a pilot, uh, all this crazy stuff. How in the heck did you end up being a chiropractor? You just all said, you said it all right there. <laughs> That's it. It's just five seconds. That's, that's all there is to it. Uh, well, I started off, uh, I went to the Air Force Academy, and, and I really studied uh, mostly astronautical, aeronautical engineering. I'm definitely a geek. I've got my membership card in my pocket. <laughs> the, uh, but that's the way my brain looks at things. And uh, learning the other side, the, uh, the left side or the right side brain has has been something I've had to work on. Yeah. But uh, I ended up flying fighters, was a test pilot uh, in the Air Force, um, and then flew for the airlines and then went to chiropractic school, which I understand is the natural progression. Yeah, that's exactly somebody, right. Somebody's <laughs> the same career. pedigree for all of us. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I was always interested in healthcare, And at the time, I was trying to go to medical school, but... The uh, military was started uh, a military medical school in in the D.C. area, but it, it was two years delayed, and that was my only gap to mm. to actually go to medical school. So I had to actually get out and, mm. and went to chiropractic school. I followed my twin brother into uh, L.A. Yeah. Uh, L.A.C.C. Um, and uh, what what a good choice that was to yeah. choose chiropractic because the more I learned. I, I found out that's really what I wanted to do uh, rather than any of the specialties in medicine. Right. Chiropractic was perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really, I, I think you guys feel the same way. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you learn the things you really need to learn to make the biggest difference in the biggest number of people. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, but what was funny with that is not many people realize it, but the engineering background really helps in chiropractic, especially in things like biomechanics. Uh, because if you understand single loop negative feedback control systems, if I lose you here, just <laughs> tell me, just hit me or something. Right here. No. <laughs> single loop negative feedback control systems, modulus of elasticity, uh, elasticity stress and strain, forcing function, damping coefficient, uh, inertia, rota mo rotating moment of inertia, all those things. And then you combine that with some materials knowledge, stress, strain, and then combine that with anatomy. You can watch a runner run and see what is inefficient in his running or throwing or whatever, or walking for us normal people. And then, and then you know, and then you, if, if, if you know it well enough, then you can see, well, obviously there's a problem between the rectus femoris and the vastus intermedius in the back part of the 
swing face, and then you know what to fix. I think too, Mike, I mean, it's never really talked about, but as far as like brains that make great clinicians, engineers are really good at critical thinking. Mm -hmm. If you think of like the American school system, it's all basically, and chiropractic college is the same. It's like rote memorization. You know, our students yeah. are basically singing songs to pass a test, you know, instead of yeah. like actually understanding the information. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes like the better maybe your memory is, the worse you are at critical thinking. But being a great clinician is critical thinking. So I think like, uh, you know, like Stu McGill, yourself, the people who do have an engineering background, they always make great clinicians because they're good critical thinkers, problem solvers. I think I think there's another step beyond that as well. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. In general, you you can say that the people who can memorize the best aren't always the best clinicians. <laughs> right. I, and <laughs> you know, I, I was told that all the time in uh, chiropractic school. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but I I think it's possible to combine both. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, and. In order to do that, though, you have to know the understand, not memorize, but you have to understand all the basic principles well enough to where putting it all together gets simple. Right, yeah. Where it's easy. And that's the hard thing to no, do. No, very. Is to, to get to that point. Like we, we like to say ART is very simple, but it's not easy. Right. And, and one of the problems is, is you have to learn to understand so many things to get really good at it. Right. And that's a step not everyone's willing to take. Yeah, right. I think most people are able to take it, at least to a great degree. Get it to a certain level, yeah. Yeah, but uh, not, and the, the majority of people are not willing to work that hard. To get to a world-class level. Get, to get to that level. Right, yeah. right. So... That leads into what our main goal is, is to raise the bar in healthcare. And so we're always looking for those people who are willing to work that hard to do it. I like that because that's such a big vision. You know, that's such a, a grander vision yeah. than just like a chiropractic thing. I mean, it's taking yeah. on, you know, well, the, all the The biggest problem in healthcare is literally everyone thinks they're the best at what they do in their town or state or in the world. <laughs> right. You know, depending how big the ego is. Yeah. There's a lot of egos in it. Oh, yeah, of course. And you, you have to get past that. You have to admit to yourself that I can get a whole lot better than I am right now. And it doesn't matter where I start. Right. I can always get better. Yeah. And that road never ends. So yeah. we're looking for the people who want to get better every day forever yeah we call it the navy seals you know like we want we don't want the 85 percent of the profession we want the 15 percent that are willing to like push the limits of what's possible for a chiropractor and you you have i had a i had an assignment to go to navy seal school really huh. in the air force but they started a program where you could learn to fly in gliders and and it was a and, and they picked a few people to be able to do that first class and i switched to that <laughs> uh, so I sometimes wonder, oh, I wish you I, needed I, wish I had thing on done CV. that. Yeah, yeah. That's right. but you know, who knows? You know, right. maybe that's why I'm still here. So. Well, and I think you you out you laid out the the grand vision of ART, and that basically that vision puts you in an authority figure early on in the, in ART. That puts you in an authority figure when it came to professional sports and stuff. Which is my second question. So. How did this come along? I know you're probably just going to say, well, it was just part of the vision. It just kind of happened. But, but where did that kind of urge to, to push it into depression sports? And well, that, stuff? that authority figure is very uncomfortable for me. <laughs> uh, I'm not comfortable at all with that. But I do understand that was and is necessary. People need to see an authority figure and believe mm -hmm. in that person to buy into what the program is. Mm. It's just the way human nature is. So, you know, I have to accept that. <laughs> so, but, but given that, the, you know, what I th thought we had to do was be able to teach something so well that people could actually get better than just what's, what the common, 
in healthcare, common denominator is healthcare, is you learn, learn a little bit of it and say, oh, I got that. Mm-hmm. I'm an expert at that, man. You tell your patients, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. Mm-hmm. So the only way to break through that is to get the buy-in, which means you have to be able to convince them that there's a lot there. There's a lot to this. Mm-hmm. So, but the way I do that is I get more and more and more technical with people until I start to lose them. Mm-hmm. And then I'll back it off to where it's acceptable. Mm. And that's where we start yeah. teaching. And, and hopefully we progress from that point. So we had, we had to develop a system of teaching that wasn't too threatening, wasn't too overwhelming, that gave them that starting point. And once they had that starting po- point, actually most people realize how much there is if they're willing to work through that starting point. Yeah. Well, we always talk about, you know, in an age where you can get a certification on a weekend, any weekend around, you can go to Colorado Springs and get some different one. The yeah. ART certification, the end of the weekend, you're nervous for your, you know, to, to put your hands on to do it. And that's a good thing because yeah, it means yeah. something. And yeah, that's, that's yeah. what we, you know, it, it yeah. doesn't mean something to have 15 letters behind your name. It means something if you actually have the skill. It's, well, the ART provider easy. list too. I mean, that's a <clears> list that, um, you know, when, when people ask, you know, do you have somebody in this particular city? You know, active release site is always one of the first sites people always go to yeah. to find because they know that that provider is going to be able to offer a certain level mm-hmm. of service. Um, the other thing that you were, I think, really the maverick or pioneer in is when you were teaching seminars early on, you were not afraid to bring up like uh, have people bring in their their difficult case, uh, patients. And uh and like we were talking about before this started rolling, people always want to bring in their hardest case. They're not bringing in their home run case. I'm, I'm convinced they have meetings to, <laughs> to make your life figure miserable. out the, the worst case possible. Let's stump Mike. Yeah. So, but tell me, like, what was your, uh, what was the beginning of that? What made you think of this will be a great idea in a seminar, you know, format to expose myself to, you know, active release protocols and technique and things like that? Well, the whole, there, there's two reasons behind that. One is people need to see how you put it all together and, and, and make it personal for a person. Right. It's, it's one thing to, see, to say, well, the subscapularis is actually the most important biomechanical muscle for the shoulder because it helps the head of the humerus back and down. And if it doesn't, it rides up and pinches the supraspinatus and, and it's diagnosed as um, an impingement syndrome. And then they cut bone away, but that doesn't fix it. It's okay. That all makes sense. Right. I mean, it's mechanically true, but when you have, when you bring a patient in and they have shoulder pain and they, let's say they can't do a push up, it just hurts too much. And in 60 seconds, you reach in and fix the subscapularis and then have them do 20 push ups. That makes sense to people on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. One is the first is, how in the world did you figure that out? So, well, you can learn that. That's what we're going to teach you. Right. And, and the second is, how great for that person. Right. That's, wh- that's why we do what we do. Right. And, and so when you get really good at it, you'll actually get depressed if you don't get a miracle at least <laughs> once a week. Well, <laughs> subtle break. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think, like, that is... Uh, Early on, you had to have let your results kind of speak for themselves. So when oh, you have your naysayers yeah. and you have yeah. your people, and uh, I've been in the professional sports world, obviously you have. So you have people that are constantly, you know, taking you down. But if your results will speak for themselves, then you always have a place at the table. In the, in the beginning, I guess it's all the time. If if you've helped people set world records, yeah, and and they know that. They'll listen to you. Yeah, right. Yeah. How, is it difficult? Obviously, you've worked with the Broncos for a long time. Um, is it difficult to play with everyone in that sandbox, or is it easy for you, or how do you guys all get along so well? Or The other providers? Yeah. It, it's, it's a actually, team. With, with the Broncos, it's actually quite easy. Yeah. Because uh, the head trainer, who just retired a year last year, the head trainer – was not ego-based. Right. 
he was just results based. Yeah, there you go. And he would figure out the way he ex ex explains it is he would go out in the community community and find the gurus in the community and bring them in to work on the players. Yeah, genius. Doesn't seem that difficult. And <laughs> he set it up that way, and it's still running that way. And and so all the all the docs that I work with are really open minded. Yeah. That's when awesome. I when I first started, they really had no clue on what a chiropractor could do. Right. And, and I didn't say anything. But little by little, they'd ask me to work on a certain case or something, and and finally. You know, it happened where a player was hurt, and they said he's out for the rest of the game and probably a, a couple weeks. And in halftime, I fixed him, and he played very well the second half. Once that happened, then the barn doors opened. Yeah. So. Now, do they, in that setting for you, does everybody want you to show them how to do active release, or do they basically leave that up to you? Like when you get there, you're going to be doing it or, you know, how does that all look? Yeah, it, it's uh, I, I think everyone wants to know what you do. Right. So there's there's a lot of people watching. Sure. And then try to mimic what you do. Mm. But what happened in particular with the Broncos is the second or third week, you know, I was fixing all these things. Yeah. And on a day that I wasn't there, one of the trainers tried to duplicate what I did. But. He didn't, he didn't have the technique down, so he made the athlete pretty sore. Right. And I got there the next day, and I saw the player, and the, the end result is, is I t toned it down and I fixed it. But the result of that, I think the player actually said, so-and-so, you're not going to be doing this on me. <laughs> So it's called a learning mode. So the yeah. head trainer said, "No one try to copy what Leahy does," and so they don't allow that. So, but they're starting to allow it a little bit now. So. Okay, so but that, it's been twenty years. So. What do you think about this? Because I I sit on a board for the Motion Palpation Institute, which we do some stuff with with ART together. So, what the whole world is telling us right now is there um, is no intra or inner test of reliability in palpation. You and I both know what a joke that is. But when that evidence-based group is telling us that we can't, you know, we can't feel things, you know, through palpation, what is your answer? I mean, I well, am like just so frustrated. It on is it. frustrating. And, and, and the problem is, is you have to understand where that person is coming from. Right. He's ignoring the science. Right. To, to make a personal point. Right. And so you have to point that out. Right. You, you, have, to, you have to educate that person that says, no, palpation is an objective finding. Right. That's established. Right. There's no question about that. You have a question about it, but there is no question. <laughs> palpation is an objective finding. Now, how good can you get at palpation? Oh, this is perfect, yeah. That's, and, and most, there are very few clinicians that can, for example, palpate relative motion between two tissues, mm. whether it is occurring or not. But it's a learnable skill. Yeah. And it's reproducible. What's the learning so curve, do you think, time-wise? One, one of the things we're trying to do now is actually give you a more concrete answer to that person. And so we're doing elastograph, elastograph ultrasonography <clears throat> research. The elastograph ultrasound can actually measure stiffness or elasticity in tissue. Oh, wow. When it's scarred, there's less elasticity. Uh -huh. The modulus of elasticity goes down when it's scarred. Right. And you can measure that on an ultrasound. So we're doing before and after treatment with elastograph ultrasound, which is showing that you can make a permanent change in elasticity of the tissues, and you can palpate it. So you have to palpate it and find it, and then fix it, and then measure it again, and it's changed. Wow. So that's a big deal. Yeah, oh, gotcha. Yeah. And, uh, but it's also fun. But the main reason to do that is it's a stepping stone to the next step, is to show that, yes, with a an accomplished ART provider, you can actually 
free up a nerve that has a traction neurodesis. And the most common example is sciatica, which is most commonly in the hip, not the spine, and carpal tunnel, which is almost never in the carpal tunnel system. It's almost always in the pronator teres. Sure. But we should be able to actually demonstrate that we can see the nerve start to slide through or under a muscle and, and that you resolve the clinical case that way. Right. Mm -hmm. We know we can do it sure. because clinically we've proven that. Uh, there, we've done studies uh, with medical schools that show, yeah, that, that's the case. You can find it with your hands. You can palpate it. Right. But you can also change it. Right. You have, a, you have a legendary reputation in your ability to uh, not only palpate soft tissues, but also palpate depth of soft tissues, internal organ, viscera. The question I have for you, uh, for a young clinician or an aging clinician, how do you, besides just saying you need to do it more, because, I mean, there's a bunch of people in the world that, that know anatomy. So there's obviously yeah. something beyond just knowing anatomy. How do you take your palpation of the soft tissues to the next level, to that point where, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're on track to be where, you know, uh, Mike Leahy is. There's, there is one way to do it. Okay. I can show you the way. <laughs> okay. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> so I'm going to do this first and then you do it on me. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm putting my fingers at the proximal, proximal edge of the pronator teres, which is right there. Uh -huh. And I, I can feel the nerve right here. This is the median nerve right here. Well, how do I know that? Well, if I go like this, you can feel the pronator teres tighten up. Right. Right. If I take your thumb, which has no muscle up here, and I go li like this with my thumb, you, with your thumb. There. Feel that little pull mm -hmm. right there? The only thing moving there is the nerve. So now I found the nerve by palpation. Right. Okay. And I know that yours is a little bit stuck to the pronator teres because when I pull this, the pronator teres go that way too. And so you, you, can, you can feel that, can't you? Right, yeah. And then you do it on me. And then w w use your fingers. It'll be the best way. Put your fingers right here. I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm just yep. going to cheat and guide you in. Now, find the pronator teres. Okay. You find it. Mm -hmm. You know, go in a little deeper. Okay, right in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. I'll move it for okay. you. Yeah. Go a little deeper and you'll feel it more. Okay, now, now go back and forth across the nerve, this way and that way. Go flip across the nerve. Go less, less, less motion. Go just back and forth, smaller motion. A little more than that and a little deeper. A little deeper. There, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it right yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, now what just happened was I first showed you that it's possible to do. Right. And you felt it. Oh, yeah. So you knew it was true. And then I put your hand on the nerve and I moved myself to where, until you could feel the nerve. Right. And I could confirm that you were on the nerve. Right. Once you're on the nerve and I confirm it to you, you'll never miss it now. Right. So you just took a big step in your palpation. Right. Yeah, so, that's interactive learning. Yeah. So, so, so what we do is then I'll show you where every nerve is until you feel it. So that, that's the way you take the, you know, a giant leap right. in your palpation. And then if you keep searching for those on people, you just get better and better. Sure. But you need that jump step right. in order to do it. You, conceivably, you could do it, but it's going to take you 20 years right. to yeah. do it. Sure. But if, people you, don't like but if you do it this way, way, if you do it this way, you'll get a lot of it. You'll get half of it or 60% of it in four days. And then the rest, if you keep working, you'll get in one year right. instead of 20. Which, uh, which tech, or let's, let's say it this way, which pathology in muscular tissue does ART remedy? So we have nerve entrapment, of course, we were just talking about that. Because you, you have, 
you know, we'll say fibrosis, adhesion, you potentially have a trigger point, you have just overall right. tone, you have spasticity. What, yeah, let's so talk about that. So there's, it's good to break it up in, into what you're actually doing in the tissues. Right. So the first is scarring. Um, there's been, since before we started ART, there was research that showed the two major ways that scarring forms, and it's not always trauma and inflammation. It's hypoxia. Uh, so those are the two main ways scarring forms. Um, so a lot of times you're actually, we use the term release. You're, you're breaking apart the scar tissue. Right. You don't actually take it out. It's not gone. It's still there, but it's not stuck. Two tissues or, it's, or parts of a tissue aren't stuck. And so you're releasing that using motion and active motion generally, right. but motion and, and relative motion between tissues. Right. So that's, it's more common that actually two tissues get scarred together than it is scar tissue in one tissue. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the first, is you're actually changing scar tissue. The second is contractures. This is one of those things that's been known for 30 years, but pretty much ignored in the healthcare professions. Myofibroblasts are ubiquitous in the body. We used to think they were only in certain fascial tissues. They're every place. Um, largely because fascia is every place. Right. Fascia, uh, myofibroblasts can actually contract and relax like a muscle does. And that thought is completely foreign to most current healthcare practitioners. Mm -hmm. Um, no matter what their degree of education is, that that that's just not. They're not a clue they're not that, that it, They're not. Yeah, they're not exposed. Yeah, to a it. ligament can contract. You know who thought? And, and those contractures are the second most common thing. You're actually changing in the tissue, and so we've figured out ways to change the contraction of a myofibroblast, and that's. A lot of that is the uh, elasticity of tissues. Mm -hmm. uh, it also gets to be length depending on the timing of the elasticity. But so those are the two main ones. Right. The uh, a little bit more involved is uh, what happens with the nerves, but it's usually caused by either scarring or contractures. Is that you'll get tension or pressure on a nerve, and so the nerve uh, doesn't react well to pressure or tension because of the circulation in the, uh, in the coverings of the nerve, the epineurium, the perineurium, uh, there's a lot of circulation there, microcirculation, and if the pressure or tension reduces the circulation, then the nerve has a degraded function. If, if you think about basic chiropractic, what, what all chiropractors agree on is that we do an adjustment to affect nerve flow. Well, that's the primary example of that. You have a subluxation, you put a little pressure on a nerve in the foramen, conceivably, and that will affect that nerve and the function of that nerve. So how do you take the pressure off? Well, in that case, you adjust it and you can take the pressure off. Well, to keep it there, you need to fix the soft tissues there so that it doesn't go right back on by the time they get to their car. Right. So you have to be able to feel those contractures or adhesions in the soft tissues around the spine or around the nerve to actually fix that right. traction neurodesis or, or neuralgia. The way Travell and Simmons described a trigger point though, do you feel active release is a remedy for just your trigger point that you're going to find in a muscle? Well, there's two ways to affect the change in a trigger point. And a trigger point is the result of contracture or adhesions. One of the two. Mm -hmm. So one, is I can put my thumb on it and push on it and wiggle it pretty hard and I can base, basically anesthetize the spindle cell to where it will finally relax the muscle. So you make a, a change. It's almost never a permanent change though because you haven't changed the contracture or the, the scarring. Mm. So if you, if you look for the scarring or contracture and then change that, which is a different 
method of manipulation. It's right. not just pushing it and wiggling it. Uh, you actually have to determine the direction of pressure or tension on the spindle cell. And, and then in the case of a contracture, you have to go against the line of tension that is predominant and hold that for usually 10 to 30 seconds. Now you've probably made a permanent change on the spindle cell. Mm. And, and you don't have to redo it every day right? Uh, in, in order to have success. And, and it's more dramatic if it's a scarring that affects the spindle cell or the Golgi tendon organ. Uh, the same process in the Golgi tendon organ. As far as etiology, you know, when we talk about joints, we talk often about you can have an internal reason why joints get blocked because the brain's not using the muscles correctly around that segment. You could have an external reason because you sit like crap for four hours and now you might benefit from a thoracic extension adjustment. Do you feel it's kind of the same thing with the soft tissues? Do, what I'm trying to ask you is, do you feel like you sometimes need to do something beyond active release to maybe change why that pathologies occur in the muscles? Or do you feel like once we, we do the procedures that now we have normalized the soft tissues, therefore the athlete or the patient is, uh, is good to go? It's the same as the spindle cell and the tendon organ. Okay. Okay. When, when you have a problem and I, I work the soft tissue, let's say I, I work the subscapularis, okay, now you can actually go up and back like that or I can do a push-up. Right. So I've changed it. Right. Okay. But what I did is I mechanically changed the tissue, the scarring in the tissue. Right. And that won't come back right away. It, it won't. It won't. Uh, it won't go backwards. It won't tend to reoccur. What it, the, the, if I changed 100% of the scarring that affected the subscapularis, it's 100% fixed and it won't come back. But there is a way it can come back. I could re-injure it the same way I did before. You're going to go right back to what I, If I did the same motion I did yeah. before and a year later I have the same thing. But absent re-injury, it's not going to come back. Right. Now, in the, in the term of posture or this muscle, what some people call muscle memory and those things. Right. It's a combination of those physical changes in the tissues, muscles and ligaments and fascia, all, all of those. But it's also in the nervous system because we're, we're going to have two ways to change the nervous, the nervous system. One is if I have a traction neurodesis or pressure on a nerve, it's going to affect what that muscle does. And it's going to be weak or, or make the muscle tight. One of those two is going to change the, the available motion. And the second is learned. So like on a baseball pitcher, the most common problem in a baseball pitcher is the subscapularis. And if that's bad, then they'll, they'll either have a limited motion or a weakness and they'll recruit other muscles and then they start injuring the the epicondyle and or or, or or the lumb or the lumbar spine, um, so you, when you fix that, you don't have them go up to the mound and throw at a hundred percent, because their body has learned a compensation, and they'll throw out their shoulder mm. if they do that. So they have to spend just a few minutes easing into it, but you will relearn, relearn that really quickly. So I tell patients, especially with gait problems, something like that, like say they have a hyperpronation in the foot. Very common problem. It's very common that because between the tarsals, you need seven and a half degrees of motion, of pronation. If the, the, the most common cause of a problem with pronation is the cuneiforms get a lack of motion, either in extension or pronation or both. So we fix those ligaments and then, and because of the lack of pronation, they've been turning their foot out to get around that. Yeah, compensate. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, a lack of extension in the first ray would be the most common. So you turn your foot out in, in or out sure. to get off your big toe. And, and you've learned that. Well, if I fix that and then tell them, don't turn your foot out, they'll have all kinds of problem in the knee. Because they can't make that pure of a correction. Would you be worried? So I say, ignore it. Right. Ignore it. Your foot's going to do what it needs to do. And you'll stop turning your foot out. And you don't have to do a thing. 
just go run. Right. And then it works. So you see, you make the structural changes, but including the structural changes to the nervous system, and the rest, the rest will occur naturally. Right. So in the shoulder example, the subscapularis of baseball, you're not so concerned on this whole movement of maybe we need to stabilize the, the scapula. Your thought would be, I'm going to normalize the tissues, subscapularis and the soft tissues, and then... Yeah, no, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. What I'm saying is you have to figure out the source cause right. first and fix that. But in your shoulder example, it's very common for a thoracic problem to cause the sure. very same yeah. shoulder problems. And if you only fix the shoulder, then it's going to come right back. Yeah. It's going to come point. right back. So I, I guess I need to answer, to really answer your question, is you need to be able to find the source of the problem. And that's what we call a diagnostic algorithm. Right. And, and that's the hardest thing to learn. But that takes the mystery out of it. You know, I, some clinicians can just watch you walk. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the rectus femoris. Oh, that, that's the peroneus longus. You can see that. Right. Well, yes, you can if, if, if you have the talent to do that. But you can also find it by doing a three-step process called diagnostic algorithm and find out which of all these things happens first. You fix that, test it again. More than half the time, all those other things, they go away. Right. Without treatment. Uh, you got Russell Wilson that you're treating, let's just say. Uh, maybe that's going to happen for the Broncos this year. And he's playing today at 12 o'clock. Are you nervous at all in having an aggressive active release session with him an hour before the game? Or are you not concerned? Or it just depends on the situation? There's, there's a... Uh, there's a thought that I think is correct that you don't get a heavy massage treatment right before you need to perform. Right. And, but what happens if you understand what happens is, is normally a, a massage, especially a heavy massage, will kind of deaden the muscles for a period of time because you're hitting the nervous system pretty hard right. when you do that. But the ART won't do that right. if you do it correctly. Mm -hmm. If you're faking ART, like a lot of people do, yeah, you're, you're going to have that problem. Right. But I've worked right up to two minutes before an event and helped a guy set a world record. Right. You don't have to worry about the time. Right. Yeah. So you want to fix all these source problems whenever you can do it. Hopefully before, so they can have a little, you know, getting used to it before, but you can do it right up to the event. Right. Yeah. So are you, um, ART, when, when I originally went through all the coursework, I mean, the results are so quick. What would you say to the people who aren't uh, uh, experienced with ART, what would be the average number of treatments that you're treating a condition, would you say? And I know it's... It depends, it depends on your experience level. Okay, so I can I can tell you that we do on-site care for several hundred companies, and the average number of treatments to resolve a condition is I think it's three point seven visits. Yeah. Three point two three, some somewhere in there. Is it was it three point seven? Three point ah, yeah, that's, that's the other number I had in mind. Three point two visits. Yeah, so that's amazing. It doesn't take very long, right? Uh, great point. So the results are quick. Uh, there was a paper that came out years ago called the Frictionless Interface Paper. It was by Bereznik, Kim Ross, and us at MPI and others. We, we took, I felt, some arrows about um, whether or not you can actually palpate depth because the argument was you have mm -hmm. layers of you know sliding fashion, things like that. One of the tenets in joint palpation in soft tissues is to be able to palpate for depth. Um, to your naysayers out there that are saying that you can't do that, can you give inspiration for people to... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we first started, there were some pretty high-level people that said it was impossible to palpate the subscapularis. That is so obviously wrong <laughs> that eventually those people kind of had to cower and go away <laughs> because it's They're so right obviously now. wrong. Now, when you talk about palpating depth, in my mind, the thing that started that was a study that was done that showed that there was sliding between tissues, and it was done on the spine, 
and, and they showed that practitioners couldn't palpate the deeper levels because the, the superficial level would slide. Right. Okay. Well, they made two really big mistakes with that study is they didn't know what they were looking for with palpation. You can feel multiple depths below, but only if you know what you're looking for. So what we do is we show people how to do that. Okay, well here, you put, your, put your fingers along here. Okay, so I'm gonna tighten all those muscles up. They're all tight right now, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna go like this. You can feel that, can't you? Yep. What's moving right there? Extensor digitorum. Yeah. Okay? Yep. Are your fingers on this extensor digitorum right now? No. They're, they're on the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. Right. Right. But you could feel the motion. Sure. Okay. Now, what also happens is, you, is what's happening is the, the extensor, uh, extensor digitorum is contracting and relaxing. So there's two motions that occur underneath your fingers. One is that muscle bulges and pushes up on the extensor carpi radialis. And you can feel that little bulge underneath yeah. there. But can you feel the longitudinal motion, proximal and distal? And most people can't. That's, that's the mistake the study made. Mm. Most people can't feel that, but I can show it to you. Yeah. Okay, so you feel something moving, right? Okay, come up an inch. Mm -hmm. Okay, now right here, that motion feels different, doesn't it? Yep. And the reason it feels different is that extensor digitorum is stuck to the extensor carpi radialis longus brevis, uh -huh. and it's pulling the longus and brevis with it. Yeah. And you feel that longitudinal yeah. motion. Right. Okay, now, now that you have felt that, uh -huh. and you know one muscle is pulling the other, now go back down to the extensor digitorum. Can you feel the longitudinal yeah. motion? You yeah. can feel it yeah. now, can't yeah, you? Because now you know what it feels like. So the reason the study was wrong is the examiner had no clue what they were looking for. Right. Yeah. And that's common with a lot of palpation studies <clears throat> you find when you, when you look they at it. They never define yeah. the terms. They never define the, you know, they're, they're not asking well, the right well, questions. The, the person had never discovered what they felt like. Mm -hmm. So right. it didn't work. Uh, on mechanism, there's a lady in Australia who's one of the gurus in tendon research by the name of Jill Cook. She tells a story of, you know, you do ultrasound or MRI on a patellar tendon, let's say, and we see mucoid changes, whatever you want to call it. There's degenerative changes in the patellar tendon, let's say. And then four weeks from now, after whatever the intervention is, the athlete is 100% better, but they redo the imaging and it looks exactly the same, which is making people kind of question is when we do soft tissue techniques, is there maybe also like a neurophysiologic event that's also potentially occurring are we truly changing soft tissues i've been dying to ask you this question so i okay. can't wait to hear but uh, again two answers yeah one absolutely there is a neurological component right but you're also making a physical change to the neurological component right and 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 the problem with the studies that show there's no in quotes no difference yeah they're not studying the right things. Right. Now, if you do the elastograph ultrasound on that, you'll see a change in the tissues. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you do a good enough regular ultrasound, you'll see a change in the relative motion between tissues. Yeah. But they, they didn't look for that. They didn't look for that. They didn't look for it. Well, and we had, we talked to Antonio Stecco, the fascial manipulation guru, and he was saying, like, they actually proved that you do make changes in the soft tissues before yeah. and after. You know, they, they, they have the imaging to, yeah. to basically show it. So they basically, you know, put their middle finger up to the world and said, no, actually, <laughs> we are making changes. And yeah. it, you can see it. Yeah, it's the, it's, it's the people that only know half the research that are most dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they use, because they're, they're the ones that say certain things are impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, not well to for years, when I went to chiropractic school, dogma in the medical schools was the SI joints don't move. Right. Now we laugh at that. Yeah, right. That's crazy. But that was dogma. The, the, the doc that figured out ulcers were caused by infections. He was drummed out of business. <laughs> he, he was blackballed. Right. He was right. 
Yeah. So true. Yeah. So, uh, Mike, when this all started, this ART adventure, it, it, it's always been hands-on. Yeah. In a world where everybody and their dog has a soft tissue instrument, a gun, a you name it. Uh, what's made ART stick to to the hand? The uh, the instruments in general. Um, the whole philosophy of it, I think, is in in error. The uh, in general, I'm I'm oversimplifying, so sure. which is unfair sure. to because the, te the the techniques are good. Yeah. But. The, the error that's made is that if I take a metal bar and literally scrape on the tissues, they say you actually want to cause inflammation mm -hmm. and then exercise it so it remodels. Mm -hmm. Well, the inflammation will cause scarring. And depending on your exercise, you may, not, may or may not be able to properly form that scar tissue. Uh, but what if you could do the same thing without causing the inflammation? It's, it's a better answer. Mm -hmm. the, now, the difficulty in, in that is it's harder to learn. Sure. It takes Easier a lot do. more effort and time to learn. Sure. It's easy to grab an instrument and scrape the tissue. Mm -hmm. the, but one of the, uh, for example, at best, it's only addressing half the problem. Half the problem is scarring. Half the problem is contractures and the effects that that has, has on relative motion between tissues. You're not addressing relative motion between tissues with those instruments. It, it, it's just so you immediately throw away more than half of what the problems are. So that sounds harsh to say that. But I don't mean it to diminish the value of those techniques. Sure. They are valuable. Sure. Sure. But what if you had a way to do it without inflammation mm -hmm. and twice as complete sure. and so twice as effective sure. and half the number of visits. That's beautiful. What about uh, your thoughts on you know massage guns and, and uh, recovery tools and stuff like that? And, Great. And Great. It, do you view them more as just a recovery tool versus a uh, therapeutic? Yeah, therapeutic tool. Uh, well, mostly recovery, but sure. it's therapeutic too. Sure. Because let's say, what if you have just an increase in tension in a muscle? Just because you're nervous or you have a lot of stress. <laughs> sure. Just because of that. The, uh, we use, like, the Hypervolt tool. Mm -hmm. It's really good at decreasing tension. Sure. And that's a good change to have. What made mm -hmm. you... Whenever you had your epiphany moment, because you have, you know, all these different massage techniques that, you know, have taught us what to do with soft tissues. At what point were you like, I think we should start using active patient movement to start breaking adhesion or, or whatever we're going to call it. But like, what made you think, because you're really a pioneer in that thought. So what made you yeah. start using active movement? Uh, that's the engineering background. Mm. When I move, when I do my elbow like this. The biceps and the uh, brachialis both move distally when I extend my elbow. What if I extend my elbow and swing it back behind me? When I swing it back behind me, the brachialis is still stretched distally. And it doesn't change when I go back this way. But when I go back this way, the biceps moves proximally relative to the brachialis. Right. So I have to have relative motion. And the best way to have relative motion is to actually move the body. Right. The, the second reason is when the patient moves his body, he's controlling the motion. That's the motion you want to fix, is the one he controls. Right. And there are other factors, like the agonist and the antagonist like relative motion, like possible traction on a nerve, like possible memory, like it's been hurting for a while and he doesn't want to go there. Right. All those are factors. So if I do the treatment with active motion, I bring all those factors into play and I can correct those factors. Right. Whereas you can't. Right. Without motion.
And in saying that, what are the biggest misconceptions in ART? Actually, what I'm trying to ask is what are the most common mistakes? I, I know one, you know, when I originally went through the coursework was um, creating compression versus tension. I know that was a big one. That's the biggest one. And the, and the second biz, uh, biggest one is a, an improper hand contact which on a technical level, it increases the pounds per square inch, the concentration of pressure on the tissues. Mm. The higher the PSI, the more uncomfortable it is and the harder it is on the tissue. That's one of the reasons the tools are harder on the tissues. The pounds per square inch is 50 times more than using your hand. Could you maybe do a demo on me just for them? They can kind of see the difference between compression and tension. The, the biggest thing, the biggest problem all providers have, me, me included, when I, especially when I first started, is that you rely on depth. Right. Because you're naturally going to assume if I go harder, it'll be more effective. Right. That's not true. Right. Harder isn't more effective. Mm. Generally. Right. So what I want to do is I want to take enough depth to grab, let's say you have a little tight spot. Uh, it's actually in between your brachial radialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. Okay. So, but let's say I just do the brachial radialis part right here. Okay, so I want to shorten it. Take my depth until I find the muscle. Now grab the muscle and pull it into tension. And hold that tension and possibly increase the tension as I go. It's going to increase by itself. Right. Just from the muscle moving. So you can feel the increase in tension. But I didn't increase my depth. Right. So that's the biggest problem people have. The second is, once you kind of feel something happening, our thumb wants to point. Yeah. I found it. There it is. Right, right. So that little radar in your thumb says, go for it. And you flex the joints in the thumb. And so the, you have 15 pounds of pressure, but half the area. So your PSI went way up. Right. It's going to hurt. Right. And it's going to hurt the tissues. Right. Yeah, amazing. Beautiful. So that's actually the hardest thing to learn. Right. Anyone can learn the anatomy. Right. <clears throat> but this is technique. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the hardest thing to learn. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, Mike, you, uh, <laughs> your level of anatomy is obviously in the top tier. What, uh, what made you so good? How, I mean, did, was it just hours in the wet lab and the anatomy lab, uh, studying books? What were some of your favorite resources that, that made you or things that maybe you still go back to today? Yeah, again, that's an uncomfortable subject for me yeah. because, you know, people get the opinion that I'm some, <laughs> you know, super smart person. But the, uh, the way my brain works is I remember – detail. It probably comes from the engineering. Sure. I remember how many miles to the sun, how many atoms in a mole, yeah. uh, you know, how long does it take, how, you know, Random. detail. Yeah. And yeah. anatomy is one of those. I, re I, I remember every artery around the duodenum still <laughs> and the ones in the brain, the things we never use, right. but actually once in a while we do right. uh, need them. Uh, but so mm -hmm. I, but I also work on my anatomy knowledge yeah. every week. I, I try to get better at my anatomy knowledge, and I've done that since chiropractic school. Yeah. So yeah, it's gotten a lot what better. Are, what are some of your your favorite resources to to maybe go back and just kind of an overlook? Let's say it's a Monday morning, you're drinking a cup of coffee, and you say, yeah. "I, I want to learn about the best the one I know of." You can is uh, visible body. Mm, the, that, that we provide on, on the iPad with our courses. It, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you can, you can spin things around. You can take layers off. And I can't see that artery very well. Take the muscles away till I see it and then put them back on so now I know the relative position. Yeah. It's so easy. Now, there, there, there are things it doesn't have. You know, some of the fascial structures, the smaller uh, you know, arteries and nerves it doesn't have. Uh, but... It, it would take a lot to learn everything that there is <laughs> on visible body sure. and have it really in your brain. But so that's a good that's start, a right? Wonder. <laughs> that's a wonder. That's a fantastic start. Uh, and I, I still use that all the time. Yeah. All the time. I'm reviewing the anatomy. The, uh, the British Greys uh -huh. and Holland's Head, an old anatomy book, 
they approach anatomy differently. And I used those two primarily as my go-to. Side by side. For, the, yeah, because uh, they're different presentations, so you can see a different. The British Grays is much more complete. Sure. So, you know, I have this really small structure that nobody pays attention to. It's probably going to be in the British Grays. Can you talk about, because we talked a lot about how you developed really good uh, skills of being able to palpate with your hands. You also have a very gifted set of eyes because you watch people move, you watch athletes move, you watch people walk, throw balls, and you are seeing dysfunction or proper function with what you're seeing. Can you talk about the marriage of, you know, what you're feeling with your hands versus what you're observing with your eyes? Because there's, a, there's an old guess. saying of what we do that, you know, clinicians – Either you're good with your hands or you're good with your eyes. And very few people in the world are good at both of those. So how have you been able to kind of marry the two of those skill sets together? And they're kind of the same, but I they're different skills. I, to be honest, I didn't think I was very good with my eyes until I, I went. Um, I was invited by another ART provider to join a world record holder in the 100 meters and to prepare him for a race for what was going to be the fastest man in the world at 150 meters. It was, uh, I, won't, I won't mention their names. <laughs> but the, uh, and the first thing that happened is we went, you know, two days before the race, we went to the, the a track, a training place, one of the universities. And uh, the, the, the coach and the provider uh, said, told the person to start warming up, jog around the track. And they said, okay. Go for it. <laughs> what do you mean, go for it? I'm here to help you. <laughs> and, and so I started doing that. Yeah. And I found out, yeah, I could see things. And, and I fixed a counter rotation in the thoracic spine, uh, which all the experts said he was going to lose the race because he couldn't run that tight. Of, it was a tighter turn than normal, and he couldn't run that kind of a turn. And in the middle of the race, he says, oh, he is, he is doing it. And, uh, but so then I realized, well, yeah, I can, okay, maybe I can do that too. Right. The, but I, I think I, I'm trying, I'm still trying to figure out how to teach that, how to see it. And I think I have an idea actually just in the last two weeks uh -huh. on how to do that. Cause we were doing a case in, uh, Portland and one of the instructors was, he's doing the case and I'm observing and it was a little slow getting to where the source of the problem was and I could see where the source of the problem was and and but one of the people in the class didn't let me get a little angry that says how did you see that what are you looking at and so I tried to explain it and I was explaining okay see the hip flexes and the, and the knee flexes and then flexion uh, the flexion of the knee is limited so as you reach the limit of flexion, is the limit sudden or is it slow? And then, okay, it's, it's, it's kind of in between. So look at the front of the knee. You can see whether the muscle and the capsule is tightening up. I said you can see it. But it's, it's hard to see, but you can. You can see, so, but that wasn't happening. So then the problem has to be in the back of the knee. So logically, I'm going to the back. Well, all the muscles are shortening. And there's nothing in the back of the knee that physically blocks it except for the meniscus. And the other thing that can, can happen is that the knee and the spine is flexing. So he's pulling the sciatic nerve roots proximal it could be either the sciatic nerve or the meniscus. Well, it wasn't the meniscus because the tibia wasn't rotating when it blocked. And it would have rotated if one meniscus was stuck. Mike, do you think so, then you should... Okay, so you do your intervention. So it ended up being the nerve at the hamstrings. Sure. So, then do you think you would expect right away to see a change in the metrics of what you're looking at? Or is it not... Because Vladimir Yandy used to talk about this where you know, you're watching someone move and then your intervention that you do, it doesn't always change what you see right away. It's just putting you in the ballpark kind of on what you need to be doing. Or it, it doesn't. 
it doesn't change what you see if you missed the source of the problem. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't mean what you worked on wasn't right. a problem. No, I get it. Yep. But you, you missed it. Right. If it doesn't change. <laughs> if it doesn't change. Okay. Um, back in the day, you said, if you can do these three moves, you can start a problem. I'll never forget you oh, saying yeah. that. And it was pronator teri, subscapularis, and iliopsoas. So, yeah. Have you changed? Is there any that you've added? I still, or? I still say that. Yeah. But the way I explain it now is the better I got, the better we got at all of this stuff. Uh -huh. the, it, it, we used to say the three miracle muscles. And if you knew how to treat those, you could make a practice. That's still true. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that is true. You could make yeah. a practice out of those three muscles. Yeah. But there'll be a high percentage of the people you can't fix. Right. And then, you know, then the next one was iliolumbar ligament. And then the next one was the uh, <laughs> inter intertarsal ligaments. <laughs> and then uh, th there was one more and one more and one more and one more and one more. There aren't three. Yeah, there's not three anymore. <laughs> there's, there's <clears throat> hey, there's a, there is a pesky injury that's driving everybody in the world crazy right now. With the advent of CrossFit, a lot of pull-ups and things like that, um, lateral epicondylitis has really kind of exploded because of all the, the pull-ups people are uh, doing. What are your – do you have any, like, really big clinical pearls for the treatment of lateral epicondylitis? We always – because people aren't really – I do. Oh, yeah. But it's not an easy answer. Yeah. The, the give, clinical give us pearl a quick is, hitter. Yeah. is, yes, you have to treat everything. It crosses the elbow on the lateral side, mm -hmm. if it's lateral up, it comes sure. out, which usually is. You have to treat them all, but you won't fix it until you fix relative motion between all of those. Mm -hmm. That's the key to epicondylitis. Mm. Love it. It's beautiful. I love it. Well, what about uh, let's let's as we're starting to close here, we're kind of hitting our, our timeline. We've had such good stuff here, but. Let's kind of look into uh, into the future here. So ART has been here. First seminar was 1988. Is that right? Yeah, I think it was 88. Okay. Mm -hmm. ART is here to stay, obviously. But then what? It, what's the future of ART? But then also a little bit further, what's the future of soft tissue? Do you see things migrating? Are they staying the same? Uh, just getting better? Like, give, give us a, a, a kind of a glimpse into the future. Well, I always think if... Uh, once we add this to the courses, okay, we're done then. <laughs> we're done then. It's never worked out that way. Yeah. So I don't know exactly where the future is, but we're, we're getting better and better at ART. Um, that really surprises a lot of the people who took the first three classes. Mm -hmm. That those people who only took the first three classes, they have less, far less than half of what ART is. And they could be so much better. So I think that will continue. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm actually writing a course now on uh, the way we teach fascia right now is we have a few cases of actually working on particular fascia, the major components, but you, 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 you start with usually a muscle or, or a ligament or a nerve and you start to work that and you need to follow the line of tension. Well, that line of tension is going to be in the fascia. And that's how you get into working the fascia. And you just follow the line of tension wherever it goes and as far as it goes. So then you'll completely work the fascia as well. So, but internal organs, we haven't made a stab at teaching. Uh, we're getting way better in the uh, spinal cord. The effects of, like uh, we just showed uh, a year ago that the rectus capitis anterior is actually connected to the dura around the brainstem. Wow. Huge implications for whiplash. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so those things are happening and they'll continue to happen. Yeah. But on, on a bigger scale, I think accurate soft tissue work is, is going to become a mainstay in our overall healthcare system. And there's a lot of resistance to that. And the resistance come, comes in two ways, ego and money. Most of the money is, is in, in the more specialized areas. Invasive, too. Invasive, mm -hmm. uh, pharmacology. Yep. Uh, most of the money is in that. And also, because money attracts, 
most of the egos are in that too. So I think there's going to be a slow shift to people who are, that not just do soft tissue, but are truly experts in it, not faking it. And they're going to take a bigger, bigger, bigger place in the, in the money of healthcare and of the acceptance or acknowledgement of expertise sure. in healthcare. It's going to happen first through insurance and second through uh, industrial healthcare. Which takes us right into ART has stapled their ground basically for corporate, uh, corporate manual therapy, corporate medicine. Yeah. Um, and so I'm assuming that that is your drive towards that. Is well, to that, that's that. the overall mission. Get to many, as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. And insurance is one way. Pro sports makes people aware of it. So, mm -hmm. But industry is probably the main way, I think. I've changed my mind between insurance and industry. I think industry is actually going to be the driver. Mm -hmm. Insurance will follow. Sure. The, uh, so we're doing as much as we can in in industry. Well, it makes sense because corporate America, they can't handle, they don't want to work with insurance companies. They just want to handle it in-house. They want to try to yeah. drive costs down by themselves versus relying on someone else. Mm -hmm. And so ART providing corporate uh, providers is, I'm guessing, a huge component of that. Well, we're getting insurance company <clears throat> acceptance of ART in particular. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies, are the larger companies, are self-insured, mm -hmm. which is more economical for them. They have the right incentives, right? Because if they incorporate ART in their company, their costs—we say we might be able to reduce their on-site healthcare costs by fifty percent. It's often eighty or ninety percent. Wow! And the number of recordable injuries the same. It's higher than we claim, uh, but they see that right away. Wow. And of course, the employees are happy with it. They don't lose their job. Mm -hmm. They don't work in pain. And the employer is happy because they save a ton of money. Yeah, and they're not having more invasive procedures. You know, they're not like, you know, being kicked down the road to have surgeries. If, and... you, do, if you do a carpal tunnel surgery, the cost of that case is $35,000. If you have ART treat carpal tunnel more successfully, it's 350 bucks. It's like the paper, uh, the MRI study, right? If you, someone with low back pain or radiating symptoms in their leg, they start with an MRI first. Then the healthcare cost is like thirteen grand, thirteen thousand dollars more. Adds thirteen thousand yeah. dollars, okay, right? Which is yeah. insane. Uh, so to yeah. your point exactly. Well, we're making progress yeah. on reversing that trend. Uh, our next project, actually, most of the people in ART don't even know this yet, but our our met, uh, oh image. What would you call it? A satellite or a project that's very visible. Yeah. To everybody, our is. Uh, reworking the military and government healthcare system because awesome. it's a closed system yeah. and, and very good uh, analysis of data sure. in right. that system. And you're motivated to see these people yeah. less, which is different than the private sector. Yeah. You know, so that would well, be and I have a military background and I've made inroads in military, like especially in special forces. Yeah. So there, there's an impetus yeah. sure. to do that. So my hope is that that will open wide. So we're that is We're starting awesome. to work hard with people in D.C. So Well, and those are the people that deserve the best care. You know, I mean, like... They, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I it really is. Especially, yeah. like, I mean... Well, the Special Forces guys, all they want to do is get back in the game. Yeah, yeah. If, if you can spend one day with them and get them back in the game, they're pretty happy. Right. And, and the cost of uh, military health care now is $58 billion a year. Wow. Staggering. And uh, all the evidence now, Mike, it's pointing to a multimodal approach to help our patients. So that would be like the combination of uh, manipulation, soft tissue mm -hmm. work, rehabilitation, perhaps dietary changes. Uh, with with the evidence pointing that direction, can you talk about like the importance of like our chiropractic colleges starting to understand some of the things that we're talking about, like the benefit of soft tissue, palpation, treatment, things like that? And where we've well, I get asked the question is, you know, what's more important, the chiropractic adjustment or the soft tissue work or ART? Now we're getting fills up. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, you know, uh, this will probably get me in trouble. But, you know, the way I explain it is, okay, if I had to pick one that I could only use, it would be ART. 
because I can fix more people that way and more completely with ART. Right. But that's a far cry from saying the adjustment isn't miraculous. Right. It is. And there's no way I would agree to a system where I can't adjust. Right. Oh, no way yeah. in the world. That's awesome. So you can't really assign a relative value mm. uh, between those. It's more complete is to have both. And I think the chiropractor has probably, arguably, the most complete system for treating the most people of, the of anybody. Decision. Yeah, that's what's awesome. Best portal of entry. You know, best, best starting point. The chiropractor should be the portal of entry, of entry for people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's perfect. Yeah. What a great thing to, to, to end yeah. on. I think Brett and I are on a literal mission and that is to, mm -hmm. to seek out the best people in the world uh, and to try to try to uh, push this all together. Yeah. And so that's what the true gestalt is, 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 uh, is bringing everybody together, bringing these, uh, these different techniques and thought processes and having difficult conversations yeah. and trying to, trying to sort through this. And, and today definitely drove that mission. So I, I'm jacked up for sure. Um, you you literally are the we're the starting point for sports uh, chiropractors and for for pushing the, the profession forward and so we're we're truly thankful for that a hundred percent and uh, seems like uh, being on campus here ART is not going anywhere so it's uh, oh, it's stronger than ever um, maybe give a, a little a uh, couple minute plug into ART what, what where do you start if you've never taken an ART ART course before um, you know what's that journey look like well. The, uh, the courses are le level one, which is where you start, mm -hmm. upper extremity, lower extremity, spine, and nerve. Take upper lower spine first, mm -hmm. and then nerve fourth. Mm -hmm. That's where you start. And then level mm -hmm. two, upper lower spine, doesn't matter which one, sure. whichever, wherever you want to start, take those. But commit to taking those seven. Yeah. Because you'll only be a pretend provider if you don't. And I don't think that's fair to our patients. Sure. I, I think we owe it to our patients to be the best we can be. And so, actually, I don't really want the people who want to take one class. <laughs> so, right. take the level one, nerve fourth, mm -hmm. and then take level two. And yeah. start off with that idea. Love it. I think that, I think... That's a really good point because I feel like ART is probably of all the different modalities that exist is probably the most bastardized technique that that's out there as far as like the, people saying they're the doing it. The biggest that. problem we have in healthcare, more than anything, and not just chiropractic, the biggest problem we have in healthcare are healthcare providers who are willing to pretend they do something. <laughs> I'm a doctor, therefore I know. That's, right. yeah. that's the biggest yeah. problem we right. have. Every year when we go to the Ironman, it's a very rewarding thing to do. So we have a, we treat during the week before the race, and we manage the finish line on race day. But every year we have at least twenty people who come. Oh, ART's here! I'm so glad! I'm so happy you're here! I see my ART provider in whatever city, and we start to work on them, and they say. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing ART. What have you had done? Well, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't do that. And then we've gotten to the point where now we have to tell him, um, you, have, <laughs> you have a fake ART provider, F-A-R-T. Yeah, fart. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't go to somebody who's willing to fake right. something. And he's a fraud. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be a fraud. I, you know, I, I want to be fair with my right. patients. So. Right. Oh, you got me on a pet peeve. No, right? that's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of so, our tenets too: is to try not to bastardize these things. You know, if yeah. we're trying to con combine yeah. things, you know, we uh, we like we, we were with uh, Antonio Stecco not too long ago, and so now we're trying to uh, all in dive into in, in fashion manipulation just to see it, but but not bastardize it. See the yeah, whole yeah, thing exactly, and then you know, deep dive on yeah. stuff like that. And so I think it's or point. if you're doing something, I think the best way I've heard to put is like if Mike Lay he was in the treatment room and you were doing ART that you would say okay that that's right yeah. versus somebody putting their own spin on it we may not be treating exactly the same yeah. but you know it should it should look the same when we're when we're doing it, i think mm -hmm. so
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. All right, yeah. Mike, thank you so much for sitting down with us. What a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. Nice to see you guys. Yes. You're an absolute, absolute superstar. You. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, again, thank Keep you. Keep spreading that rumor. Yeah, yeah. we, we <laughs> will. We'll do that for you. So uh, activerelease.com uh, is uh, basically everything that you can find there. And uh, man, if you get a chance to take a course. Take one color, right here. Yes. Uh, we're looking at these views. You got to take oh, it right here. Gosh. We'll, we'll include a, our travel video with all this. And uh, yeah, just... Uh, what a place to learn. Awesome. And thank you, Aaron. For yes, that's yeah. right, Aaron. Thank you so much yep. for, for setting this all up and for, for having us out here. So um, awesome, guys. Thank you all for tuning in. Mike Lady. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gasol Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.